What is co-production? Working together in equal partnership for equal benefit. We're both getting benefits from this partnership and from this collaboration. What we recognise is that even when we haven't been doing co-production, my take is always that I'm using co-production principles because I value what people bring and I value that if I can enable everybody to bring their best, we're likely to get a really good outcome. Like an artist with a blank canvas, Imagine being given a blank piece of paper with the challenge of shaping the future of health and care through better research. How and where would you begin? Hello, I'm Kisha Patel from Bainstock Hindu Society. I was invited to take part in the co-production. I was intrigued to find out what is co-production and help health inequalities. This podcast is a story of a journey into the unknown, where we aim to shape the future. Before planning begins, we need to understand what co-production means and how it will help researchers seeking better outcomes in healthcare. Hedda Parsons is a former patient who is now a public and patient involvement and engagement officer based in Southampton. She believes researchers can learn a lot from the patient's lived experience. For me, co-production is an opportunity for people who are trying to achieve the same thing. In our case, the best possible public partnership work to support research, to come together and work with complete trust in the group they're working in and in the process. And you achieve that by making everybody feel that they're equal and equally valued. And a recognition that all the ideas that come out can't be taken forward. It's never like that. But together we can decide what are the best ideas to take forward. I think in any field of work, there's always a sort of golden chalice. It's it's if we could do it this way, it would be the very best way of it being done. And in patient and public involvement and engagement work, we know that co-production is the gold standard. So I think you have to be really clear with people about what, if there are boundaries, what they are, and then co-produce in that space. But I genuinely believe that by co-producing, we'll get the best outcomes. The idea of better quality research is not a reflection on the work done in the past, but more an opportunity to reach groups of people who were not previously having their voices heard. The question is how to reach them and benefit from their experiences. This is where co-production comes in. But what is it and how does it work? Dr. Mel Hughes is an Associate Professor in Social Work and the Deputy Director of the Research Centre for Seldom Heard Voices. Co-production is one of those things, isn't it? Actually, it's been around forever. And there are some people that have been doing some incredible co-produced work for a long time that have suddenly found themselves becoming very popular and very sought after, I think. My take on it is the real push and driver has come from a recognition of the inequalities in health and social care research and a need to address that. And I think things like covid and research around COVID and the inequalities that COVID highlighted probably pushed that um, a lot further. I think we were starting to look at that anyway. I think it pushed it a lot anyway, but also things like Black Lives Matter. And I think what it's done is it's made a lot of us in the research world really stop and think about actually who is it we are involving and how are we involving them and how effective is that involvement in terms of people actually having a say and an influence that's going to make any difference. For for me, it's been a long time coming and it's absolutely fantastic to see that recognition of the need now for co-production. The risk is people using the term, but not fully understanding what's involved in order to do it properly and to do it well. We have a really good working relationship with Bournemouth University, and that's really important to me. 
because Bournemouth University I see as being a forerunner in co-production work, mainly because of their peer group, which is the name of their public involvement group. And the way that they've created that group, the way that they work with that group is all based on co-production principles. Whenever you're trying to do something new, even if you absolutely believe in it and feel confident in your ability to facilitate things, there's always a place for someone with greater expertise than you. All of us are always learning. So to work in partnership with people that were doing this already, with people that have written about it, with people who feel confident in this approach, seemed to me to be the most appropriate way forward. But not only that, Bournemouth is part of Wessex and our job is to have a Wessex reach. By networking and partnershiping across Wessex when we do any public involvement, we're strengthening the work, we're strengthening the message around public partnerships because we're demonstrating that we're keen to go out there. When we kind of have that conversation about what, so what is it we want to communicate? What are the messages we want to share in this workshop? And this, we have this conversation with our kind of peer members and colleagues all of the time. What we realised is even with the best intentions in the research world, and I'm very much part of that, we are often very process driven, very system driven. We like a checklist. We like a deadline. We, you know, we'd like clear kind of parameters. And yet all of the work that we do with our colleagues with lived experience, there are often different priorities and different motivators. So right at the beginning, we decided with this workshop and with others that we do, that actually rather than listing good practice, which people often think that they're doing even when we might think that they're not, we decided to focus on how it feels. And it was that that got the reaction at the workshop, particularly from the public contributors and community partners that were in the room because we talked about how does it feel when co-production is done well how does it feel when co-production is not done well so does it feel like you are an equal partner does it feel like it's of equal benefit and that is actually seems quite obvious and seems quite fundamental but actually we often lose sight of that in the research world, which is very much about, is there a job description? And does everyone know what their roles are going to be? And it's much more about those sort of metrics. All of our colleagues that attended that day are much more interested in, actually, how do you harness lived experience expertise? How do you really understand what life is like for different individuals or different communities in order to then understand how they might engage with healthcare or social care or with or, or with research. It's that repositioning ourselves to understand what life is like for people. Another of the public contributors who participated in the day's event was Gregory White, who is the founding director of an IT and media company called Drop the Mask. It's a community interest company which creates employment opportunities for those with physical and mental health disabilities a subject close to his heart. Greg was keen to take part and ensure voices like his were heard. It's a huge step forward for someone who once struggled to walk into a coffee shop, to being placed in a room with healthcare professionals and decision makers. I wasn't sure how much of an input that I'd have. So it was a first for me at that level and thinking how much hierarchy is going to be in there and um, what sort of direction it's going to take. And I was pleasantly surprised they had a presentation and they were discussing about making sure that you always um, are able to work on co-production with people that are not necessarily medically trained or haven't worked in the sector. It's about lived experience and what people are going through and making sure that you get a whole collection of information right across the board. So the co-production for me was something that I felt um, for the first time was actually being done, or, yeah, I was quite surprised by how good it was, actually. In my experience, um, in the three years that I've been working, um, you know, full drop the mask, we'll start and drop the mask, and the connections we had... Is the first time that I felt that 
my experience or from what we've done in the last three years is the first time that it was actually not just heard, it was listened to. It wasn't concrete. It is what do you think, right or wrong, or agree with us. It was actually asked for the experience. So it felt like shoulder to shoulder, completely on par and non-hierarchical. So what that allows in those situations is an environment that allows you to be able to drop any fear around um, the fear of hierarchy or thinking that somebody, because they got certain training or medical background, that you know they may always be right and maybe what you say from your experience could be seen as wrong. And I didn't feel that at all, which was amazing. Once everyone had arrived, we began our first day of co-production. It began with a number of workshops. The most important thing that happened when Mel and Kate and Chrissy from Bournemouth came to work with us was the energy and excitement in the room. The public contributors in the room, the researchers in the room, the scientists in the room, the project managers in the room, everyone was going, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, this is great. This is a great way to work. You've got it, haven't you? It's ignited your and you're, you've got people on your side ready to help you move it forward. And that, to me, is the beauty of what happened that day. One of the issues with co-production is that it isn't fast. It can't be fast because you have to listen actively first. And then you take the steps at the pace that the group is ready to take them. All of my expectations were realised in the workshop and the subsequent roundtable discussion. In that, my expectation was it would go at the pace of the group. I found the workshops really interesting. And on the day, we talked to many co-participants and we learnt a lot of things about barriers to health. Once we, we know the decision makers, we can really convey our true voices to them. And that was really, really good. I felt that I was heard and listened to, and we hoped that this would be taken up by the decision makers. The afternoon session brought everyone together to share ideas. Heather explained the importance of the discussion and our views being heard. We have this challenge um, in the patient and public involvement engagement team, which is to devise a strategy around patient and public involvement and engagement for the Biomedical Research Centre and the Clinical Research Facility. And it's a joint strategy between the two organisations. So this morning's starter, having that workshop, was to get us all on a similar page about what co-production is. And the conversation now, I'm really going to throw open to you about how do we do this? How do we make it happen? How do we do it well? What do you think the challenges might be? Kay, I'm probably going to come to you. <laughs> I just think it, you know, with your pending role, it, it's really helpful to understand what you thought about this morning and what you think it means for our strategic development work. Really interesting and hugely valuable. The, the message that I've um, underscored is the equal partnership for equal benefit is that yeah. correct that is that is the absolute thing my takeaway message from today with my brc hat on that causes me great anxiety in terms of the strategy because what i really don't want us to do is to produce a strategy that has no legs it has to be something that actually delivers equal partnership for equal benefit mm -hmm. and I don't know how we're going to do that and I don't want it to be tokenistic but I also am anxious about the the way that the, the strategy may be perceived by the people who are funding us if it does not seem to be trying to achieve enough and it may be that therefore we have to have conversations with our funders explaining whatever the strategy come, we come up with. Overwhelmingly, I want it to be valuable. I want it to be something that we co-produce that is meaningful and not tokenistic. It was a warm and welcoming session and everybody felt comfortable to talk to each other and express their views. I believe people were encouraged to open up 
and they could express their lived experiences and they felt that they were being listened to. They were able to express their ideas and thoughts and their voices. They start quietly, but they have lots to say. How about getting someone, because you all sat there medically trained, and when you're working on your strategies, someone else, <laughs> someone else from an outsider looking in on your strategies, rather than you all come up with it, and like it, you all change and you all that, talk in that kind of language, and someone else looking in on it, so someone from the public, or, or no medical experience, then going, well, actually, that, do, that doesn't look right. I, I think when we're looking at this, it's really daunting because it's, we don't know where to start. And what I would say first is what we mean by strategy, because what I'm not thinking is it's a document that we need to get the wording right. It's an approach. It's a way of working. It's a cultural change. It might be an organisational change. It's how do you want to involve the public going forward? And for me, it starts with the relationship. It's getting the right people from the community, we've got some here, around the table, not to help to write a strategy, not to help develop a strategy, but just to explore with a great big blank piece of paper, how do you want to be involved and why do you want to be involved? And we capture all of that in terms of what's important to you in order to then inform a strategy. Yeah. It's not about a paper document. It's about an, an approach, just as, as you were saying. I absolutely accept that. And I think um, that was kind of what Joss was getting at as well with the whole culture piece. The issue always is that we do have to produce a strategy a by strategy. a date to an organisation. I am not entirely sure that we will be able to... to so we will end up probably having to put in a strategy that ticks the box, which is what we don't want because we have this deadline. So how do we write that strategy that then gives us the flexibility to go back and do what you say, which is that proper piece of work? Because we're not going to do that. Within, we're not going to manage to do it within the next three months. We have to get the strategy in, are we? I think, though, if you even if you have three or four workshops with lots of community partners, you would come away with gold that would inform your strategy. And I think the strategy needs to be clear in how and why you're going to be doing it. So that's what hopefully you would have got within the next three months is how and why people want to be involved, which is why we're doing a, di a, a direction rather than a map. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think they've given us any guidance about how the strategy has to look. So I think we actually could do exactly what you mm. said, which is bring in those other documents or videos. Or mm. I, I don't, we, with some of our other strategies, we've got a template that we have to yeah. follow, but with the PPIE one, I think it's up to us. So I think there is real scope for doing that. And it's very difficult to argue against if you've said, this is what we've co-produced with a group of community partners and this is what they've said around how and why. So, you know, if we're talking about um, the fact that you've brought in people and you've co-produced your strategy, I would see that as a huge positive. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think people there would as well, I hope. Anyway. And also, it's about changing research. So it's all been done this way from the past. We're rewriting the book again. Well, hang on a minute. If we change it and do it this way, we're going to get a great outcome at the end of the end of it. And I think that's what funders want to do because everyone's rewriting and rewriting and rewriting, and it's useless, and it's not being used. So that's why we're doing it again. So let's do it. Do it to a proper standard this time. And actually, everyone being involved rather than just. The, the medical people. The bit that's missing in clinical research is the human bit, isn't it? Of the trust and the people wanting to do or be involved, to have a voice to say, perhaps there's a lack of involvement you find, I don't know, but perhaps it's because we haven't got that inclusion or our self-knowledge to talk about it sometimes. And that's really interesting, isn't it, from a clinical trials perspective, because, you know, we often, we will have trials, not often, but we will have trials that actually are quite difficult to recruit to. And it, it is always what we what we know in the public involvement field is we need to go out and talk to communities and find out why it's hard to. Yeah. Um, and sometimes the deadlines are such that it's like, well, we've got to recruit by this date and we haven't got time to go. So the, the most important bit about the strategy for me is creating space and time so that we do build in stepping stones that take us in a direction that will create change. And that, you know, I 
I talk a lot about compassionate research because in my head, compassion is about hearing what it's like to live with the condition, to have that treatment, to be involved in a trial and then doing something about it. Mm. And until we get to that compassionate research, research that is listening and changing, we're not going to have the involvement and the, the level of outcome that all of our scientists want because the reason they're involved in science is because they really want to make a difference in people's lives ella hasn't said anything i'm just thinking as a young voice do you think there's any things we have to think about specifically about how we might involve young people i mean yeah i mean even sitting around this table today i everyone's a lot older than me and yeah it feels like maybe i don't have i can't contribute the same sort of thing age-wise, experience-wise, training-wise, any of that. So I think there should be thought put into that when it comes to activities, meetings, round tables, accessibility again, isn't it really? It's, it's accessibility in all forms, whether that's disability, whether that's age. I think that's important and that's, I think that's where the focus should be is that it is accessible and hidden things that might... Okay, we're accessible in this way, but are we accessible in the un, in the unformal ways? One of the things that we've found around inclusive involvement, I'm interested to know what you think about it. With the the reason, one of the benefits of the community researcher model, where we've got people with lived experience of the topic being explored, as the co-researchers, all the researchers, all the facilitators of the workshops we're talking about, is that we've found that people want to see themselves reflected back. So actually a workshop by disabled people for disabled people made people come and made people stay and made people open up. And I'm just wondering around age, actually would that make a difference if it was a workshop focused on young people or young adults or whatever age group, would would that make a difference? I, I think it would, I definitely do. I think there's like, there's an assumed hierarchy that comes with age that if you're older you have more experience you have more knowledge and so I think if I was sat around the table with everyone who is my age right now I think well there'll be a different discussion anyway because we bring a different perspective but I think yeah there would there would be more comfortability there I see all this that to go to to the people and you know to get but I think we as as BRC as an institution as we need to see that we are not going to build that. You know, we're not going to build that thing that is out there. That things that are already built. Oh, yes. You yes. know, it's not, I'm not going to invent something that no. is there. You know, and this is what we need to, to, to use and use our resources to maximize that. They are there. I can go there. But they are also need to be infrastructures or structures that they maintain themselves. Let's see how are we build our strategy. Maybe we can have now a vision and an objective. When the roundtable discussion was finished, I felt it was very useful. I felt that we were, our voices had been heard and the decision makers and the researchers were going to carry forward some of the ideas and thoughts that we had put forward. But what did Craig think about it? I have dissociation disorder. I don't like having anybody behind me. Environment is always important. And I know there's a lack of space, but I did mention that sometimes perhaps it should be done where possible within the community as well, in a bit more of a relaxed situation. If you're involved in community partners, community links um but overall what kept it calm was the people it it felt really comfortable how people talked there and how people dealt with some you know questions you felt like you were spoken to and heard okay i think i think it was quite a good balance there and and the people make that i feel i feel in a social way that things need to change that there needs to be more input from companies especially community companies smaller charities and groups a way where we're able to give a lot more experience than opinion that we're able to not have the fear of not being listened so i see this as a building up of a bit of a crystal wave for um 
for social enterprises and social profit companies like us, um, for organisations and public bodies, councils and NHS trusts to perhaps get involved with us in a, in a different way than what's seen as normal. So for me, that's really, really exciting. When one of the main aims is to ensure that groups who may be facing social and health inequalities are included, there are challenges. Dr Mel Hughes believes there is a strong desire for change. I'm hoping that they took away that it's the system that needs to become more inclusive and that it's researchers that need to build their kind of skills and confidence to do, to do more kind of community engagement and, and more inclusive research. And that all the support that is needed is to develop researchers to be able to build capacity uh, within the workforce to be able to do that, rather than perhaps what we've relied on previously, which is almost training people up with lived experience to fit into the research world. We need to adapt the research world to be more inclusive. And so to the end of the very productive first session, it was a day full of ideas, hopes and ambition, but one which brought together health professionals and patients working towards a better future. For Heather Parsons and her team, the work starts now. How was she looking forward to the challenges which lie ahead? If I'm really honest, I was scared because we have deadlines that are set externally by the national funders. And one of those deadlines was to create a strategy. And there wasn't time between what we did and when that had to be in for us to achieve that. And the reason there wasn't time is because a lot of the public members and the community representatives were saying, we don't want to write something. And yet we have to write something to give to the national body. I then had this dilemma about the people that I'm going to work with to deliver the strategy don't want it in the format that the funders who gave the money for it to happen want it. How do we move that forward? How does that happen? We have to write something that, you know, I couldn't find a way for that not to be. Would they accept in the first step was writing something that captured the essence of what was important to them and trust us that from that moment when it was written, everything would be done in a way that followed the philosophy and the beliefs that we have around co-production, that it doesn't have to be written, that we could video stuff, we could put out audio, we could just go and talk to people, which is what they were saying they really wanted. For me, from the age of seven through to my... um early 50s I was pretty locked down by neurodiversities my my mental health was severe I didn't have a clue about um having autism or Asperger's ADHD and a few other things that over the years that sort of makes sense to me now and uh, I feel it's just been like a, a 40 year pause button of collecting information experiences and to be able to feed that back now through into different systems and I, I, I just feel that, you know, this should have happened decades ago, but it takes change to change things. And hopefully this is just the start of a change, especially in this area, Southampton or Hampshire. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Really wonderful to see so many of you here joining us today for our co-production event. In the this conference room on the third floor of Southampton General Hospital, Caroline Teaser welcomed delegates from across the Wessex region to the first public meeting where we began a journey into the unknown. Our shared common aim was to attempt to find the solution to better health outcomes through improved research using something called co-production. I'm Kisha Patel, from the Basingstoke Hindu Society, I am one of the public contributors who went along to find out more at their first public meeting. We all signed in, wrote our first name on a sticker and attached it to our clothes, but were asked to give no further information or clues as to who we were or why we were there. I was then directed to a table where I joined five other strangers. After Caroline's introduction, and a few words from Dr. Chris Stock, 
the team's lead PPIE officer, Heather Parsons, explained why there was a veil of secrecy. The reason that you've been asked just to use your first name and to um, not to talk about what your job you do is just because we're really conscious from working with different people that it actually creates a sort of power imbalance um, for some of the members of the public. So we really wanted people to just come in and be themselves and talk about you as a person. And But by coffee time, we will be revealing roles <laughs> and things. So in these first bits, we just want us to be here as people together and support each other and be able to um, just chat as human to human and not worry about what we do for a job or where we are academically or not academically or what we are as what, what condition we might have, but just to be together and enjoy the company of each other in that way. Later, we all shared ideas with the healthcare professionals and members of the public, but first we needed to get to know each other. Difficult, considering how little we were allowed to say. Barney was the team member who set us a challenge to break the ice. What we would like you to discuss the next 10 minutes or so is something that you have learnt as an adult outside of education and outside of work. So it might not always have been a pleasurable experience, but you sort of embarked on, on learning this skill, thinking that it would be fun. The room filled with fascinating stories. A lady called Rebecca shared one which everyone enjoyed. At the age of 40, I started learning to play the drums, so it's a little while ago now. I asked my husband for my birthday if I could have a drum lesson um, because I'd always wanted to learn to play the drums at school and it wasn't possible because I went to an all-girls school and there wasn't a drum kit, no girl, no other girl wanted to play the drums, it seemed. And so I finally got my wish at the age of 40. I went for like a taste of drum session, session and found that I seemed to have some natural ability. So I carried on with drum lessons and then after a couple of years I got an electronic drum kit. The exercise helped everyone bond within their group and calmed any nerves before the main discussions began. This was the first of three sessions across the week and Heather outlined what she hoped would be achieved. The three co-production days that were held in person with the public, researchers, academics, clinicians, voluntary sector, became an imperative, really. It had to be, we had to start a process. We had to start going out wider to bigger groups to, to get an understanding of the needs of the different people. And the reason being was when we wrote our strategy, what we said was everything we deliver here on in, we will aim to deliver in best practice through co-production, co-design, co-delivery. This is the first stepping stone in the river of co-production on the journey toward creating the very best public partnerships in research for Wessex and the research that goes on there. Meanwhile, back in the room, every group began sharing ideas by working together and building partnerships. Two important elements of the day. But first, who are we and why were we there? I'm Claudia Murg and uh, I have been a researcher in some form or another for over 30 years. Um, I am a journalist and filmmaker, documentary filmmaker, but I'm also interested because for the past 30 years I worked as an interpreter and a lot of my work for my Romanian fellow citizens involves NHS establishments. I am a creative director for a national advertising agency. We work with a lot of the uh, general hospitals around the country um, and we've been directly involved with a lot of research as well in creating infographics to go out. Um, so we're involved in a lot of these things in the background. That's, that's me in a nutshell. <laughs> I wanted to make sure that our Asian voices were heard which are seldom understood. And that was very exciting for me to be there on that co-production day. Thank you so much. Thank you for um, taking part in that. Yeah. It was absolutely amazing going around the groups and listening to some of the fabulous ideas that people had. Let's start just by collecting some of those ideas. I'm going to try and talk and write and not trip over the table. I was looking for information about PPI in, in POSMO, but I didn't have the information. So actually it will be interesting if we had some more information 
I don't know, living a leaflet in the GP surgeries, for example, and tell people that this is what we have, this is what we do, you are invited, we go meetings these days, you can be part of us, or just bring your idea. Perhaps we've targeted certain audience, so for example, youngsters under 21 year olds, so situations where it's worked, and it's worked well, and what happened? Better use of social media, um, I think TikTok was mentioned. Is that right? <laughs> With everyone working together, suggestions were written on post-it notes which were stuck on the whiteboard at the end of the day. There were so many exciting ideas. Time flew by before Dr. Chris Stock from the Southampton Centre for Research, Engagement and Impact closed the event. Thank you to everyone for the amount of effort and the positive energy that's been poured into this today. Um, it's obviously not, not going to be an easy task, but the team are going to collate the, everything you've put into this meeting and anything else you want to share afterwards, um, together with what comes out of the next event on Saturday, um, the day we're holding in Bournemouth, and then also an online session. We will bring that all together and identify uh, the top few priorities to take forward. And I'll hand over to Heather. Our greatest thanks goes to you, the participants. I, I just, if you just look at the board and look at what we've got, it's just amazing. And we knew it would be because we know when we work with people individually that the energy is out there, the passion is out there, and we know that together we can do something really important here. So thank you so much for everything that you've offered today. And on that note, I'd just like to say goodbye and travel safe. Thank you very much, everybody. I thought it was well organised, well managed, and it was so brilliant that we could talk to other seldom heard voices. We feel sometimes that we can't say what we feel and say what we think. And this gave us a perfect opportunity to talk with health professionals. And this will be a great example when I go back to be a leader, an example to the community to take part further. I think these are the sort of meetings we need to have to be able to get people's ideas and views and we've had a nice diverse group of people in here with lots of ideas so I think it was a success. What was good was the fact that you let us all mix and mingle and that we weren't allowed to say whether it, that was really good, whether we're a public contributor or whether we worked, that was great. I think it was brilliant actually. Right from the beginning when I first got here it was just so welcoming and open it didn't feel hierarchical. Everyone had this common goal of wanting to get as involved in research as possible and to really do research, which made a difference to, to everybody. I think the main thing I'm going to take away is that, well, it's that I want to continue to be involved in the process and that it's something that even just the, the act of how to co-produce is something that we can all co-produce co together. It's nice to meet the people behind the names and the acronyms. and Yeah, so I think that's what I'll be taking away mainly. Of course, now the hard work begins. After three co-production sessions, the team has a huge list of ideas from people across the Wessex region. Somehow, Heather Parsons and her team must put together a very complicated jigsaw. I think across the, the three events, we're going to see... They might be, not be the same specific activity, but we'll see themes of things that people need. Communication is often a core theme and then delivery of that. It then gives us, you know, I, I've talked about stepping stones in the, in the river of co-production over to this moment of fantastic public partnerships. I think it's more stepping stones. So which ideas or theme do we take forward first? Let's put that stepping stone in place. Let's bring together a small working group across all of the different roles in research and try and create something that helps everybody. And then from that, that work will continue then into the future. But then we can start another piece of work. But we do it at the pace that's right for the community. It's going to be exciting to see what the future brings. I'm Kisha Patel. Thank you for listening. <laughs>